This Ethics Podcast is dedicated by David Steppen in loving memory of his parents, Barbara and Harvey. May their souls be elevated in heaven. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. We are up to chapter six, Mishnah number three. Halo made me chavero perak echad, one who studies from his fellow man a single chapter of Torah. O halacha achas, or a single halacha, single law of Torah. O pasak echad, or one verse. O dibur echad, or one single Torah statement. O afilu os achas, or even a single letter of Torah. Tzarech linok bo kavod. You have to accord that person honor. Someone teaches you Torah, it doesn't matter the volume of Torah, it could be a whole chapter, it could be even one letter. If they teach you Torah, they have now endowed you with some divine wisdom, and it's important for you to record them honor. Well, how do we know that? For this is how we found, this is what we saw in the case of David, king of Israel. He did not learn from Achitofel, one of the advisors, the king's advisors in the days of David, he only learned two things from Achitofel. Dovad only. And he called him, he labeled this Achitofel character, his teacher, his guide, and his confidant, his, his friend. Shenemar, it quotes a verse, Va'ata enosh ke'erki alufi umiyuudi. And you are a man of my measure, meaning you're my equal, you're my peer, alufi, you're my guide, umiyuudi, and you are my confidant. This incidentally is talking about, this is a verse in Psalms, where David is talking about all of his enemies, and he mentions Achitofel, who was a confidant, and even taught David something, but eventually became his enemy. Vahalo Dvarim Kavachomer. The the issue of this matter is a Kavachomer. Kavachomer means if you learn from something in a in a in a limited fashion, certainly it's going to apply in a in a more obvious fashion. This is, I think, the fancy word for this is a a fortiori. And they explain here on the bottom a logical argument where if a property applies in a weak case, it certainly applies in a stronger case. Uma David, Melech Yisrael, if David, king of Israel, shalom, lamar me'achitofa, elishnei dvarim bilvad, he only studied from Achitofel two things, and that's it. And nevertheless, karo rabo alufo miudo, he nevertheless gives him the honor and calls him his rabbi and his teacher. Halomid mechavero perak echad, o halacha achas, o pasak echad, o dibur echad, o filo os echas. If someone learns from his friend one chapter, one law, one verse, one statement or even one letter, al achas kama v'kama. David accords honor to Achitofel. Even though he only taught him two things, certainly when we are taught by others, we should accord them honor as well. Al achas kama v'kama, certainly, shetzarech linod bo we have to treat them with honor. Vein kavod el Torah, and there's no honor. Honor is not deserving, aside from Torah. Shenemar kavod chacham yun chalo, the verse says, honor, the wise shall inherit. Utimimim yinchalu tov, and the perfect shall inherit good. Vein tov el Torah, and there's no goodness aside from Torah. Shenemar ki lekach tov nasati lechem, Torah si ata azovu. For I have given you a good teaching, my Torah do not forsake. So this is a, a law and mission to convey this idea that Torah is so precious. It's so good. It is the only good. It is so deserving of honor. It's the only thing that makes a person deserving of honor that if someone teaches you Torah, if someone begets you Torah, even if it's a very minimal amount, a very minimal quantity of Torah, nevertheless, you should give them honor and you should accord them respect. And even if it's only one letter, you should still do it because after all, look what David did with Achitofel. David was the king of Israel. The king is the top of the food chain. Achitofel turned out to be a traitor, a mutinous traitor against David. But nevertheless, because he taught him Torah, he honored him and even called him his superior, his teacher. Now, this Mishnah really is a continuation of the theme of this chapter. As we mentioned earlier, this chapter, the sixth chapter of 
Perkei Avos is actually technically not a Mishnah, it's a Brisa, which is a, a Mishnahic era teaching, but not really part of the Mishnah. That's why there are fewer commentators on this particular chapter, but the theme of the chapter is one of that is Torah studies. We talked about Torah study and, what, and how it changes a person, and if someone studies Torah, well, they are transformed forever, and it uplifts them, and it transforms them. And there's so many things that they receive in the merit of their Torah study. That was the first Mishnah, the first teaching of this chapter. And then we read about last time in the second Mishnah, how if someone neglects Torah study, it's a terrible devastation. And now the focus of Mishnah number three, six, chapter six, Mishnah number three is, okay, what's the relationship with your teacher? Even if your teacher teaches you very little, nevertheless, you are eternally indebted to them because after the world, they gave you a little bit of life. They gave you a little bit of eternity because they gave you Torah. So it doesn't matter how much of eternity is. If it's eternity, it's eternity. And therefore, you must accord them respect, as we see by David and by Achi Tofel. So the theme of the chapter is, is the importance of Torah study. And in our Mishnah, it teaches us how important it is to accord respect and honor to someone who benefited you in Torah and someone who truly appreciates what Torah is and recognizes how it's the ultimate gift. It's the ultimate goodness. It is the ability for mortal and fallible human to have access to divine wisdom. It's more precious than pearls. If someone gives you a pearl, a pearl of wisdom, certainly you should accord them honor. So someone who truly appreciates what Torah is about and the value of Torah certainly will behave that way towards someone who teaches them Torah. Now, the commentaries explain that the first Mishnah told us, the first Mishnah of this chapter told us that when you study Torah, you are transformed, you are uplifted, you are being nudged and dragged towards being more of an angel and less of a beast, less of an an, less and less of an animal. And now we're being told just how stark this transformation is, this elevation is. Even if all you've received is one letter of Torah, it's only one letter of Torah. It seems to be negligible and insignificant. Nevertheless, it already achieves this transformation, this elevation, and thus someone who benefited you to give you that one letter of Torah, that person is deserving of your honor and your respect. Now, all the commentaries on this Mishnah, they ask the very obvious question. The Mishnah starts off and says, well, if someone teaches you Torah, be it a whole chapter, which sounds like a lot. A whole chapter of Talmud, you could spend months, maybe even years studying it. But even if it's only one halacha, one law, or even one verse, or even one statement, or even one letter. It's only one letter. It's not even a full word. Nevertheless, you must accord them honor. And the evidence for this, what's the evidence? Well, look at David and Achitovel. Achitovel taught him two laws. And therefore, if he, if, if he honored him with two laws, certainly you must honor others who teach you Torah. But this does not prove, at least on a technical level, maybe you only have to honor people who teach you laws or two laws. How do we prove from David and Achitofel that even if it's one letter, Achitofel taught him two laws, not just a letter? So there's a technical problem that all the commentaries asked on this Mishnah, and that opens up a portal to understand what's actually happening in this teaching and what the deep lesson is really all about. Now, just for some background, who was this Achitofel character? David, of course, we know David is the king of Israel. He is considered the Mashiach Hashem, the Messiah of God. He is the descendant of Judah, and he's the the founders of the uh, of the Davidic line, the Davidic monarchy. We know that the Monarchy must go through David. Messiah is a descendant of David. David, we know, author of Psalms. Of course, the book of Samuel is really all about David. David 
the father of Solomon, another great hero of Jewish history. David we know. Who was Achitophel? So Achitophel appears, of course, in Scripture. He was an advisor to David. Apparently his advice was very good. But he made the unfortunate decision to join the mutiny when David, when David's son, Avshalom, when he launched an insurrection, a mutiny, a rebellion against dad, Achitofel switched sides and joined the camp of Avshalom to his detriment. And the Torah tells us, or the Tanakh tells us, the scripture tells us, how he gave all these pieces of advice. One piece of advice, Avshalom accepted, and that turned out to be a good piece of advice. And a second piece of advice, Avshalom rejected. And as a result of that, Achitofel committed suicide. But the Talmud tells us, and this is very germane to our Mishnah, the Talmud tells us that there are three kings, three sovereigns, and four lay people that are perma-banned from Olam Abba. That they are forever locked out of Olam Abba. They can have no portion in the afterlife. This is a Mishnah in the book of Sanhedrin on page 90, towards the bottom, the first Mishnah of the final chapter of the book of Sanhedrin. Who are these four lay people that are perma-banned from Olam Abba? Bilam, we're told, Doeg, Gechazi, and Achitofel. So this is very relevant to our subject. David is according honor to someone who used to provide him counsel, but someone who is a traitor, someone who mutinously joined a rebellion against King David, and nevertheless, David is according him honor. But not that. That's not, all, that's not it. This is someone who, unlike the rest of the Jewish nation, is forever locked out of Olam Abba. He is a villain for all eternity. There's nothing that can be done to rescue him, to save him, and restore him to righteousness. And nevertheless, David is according him honor. And David was a king. And David was also the head of the Sanhedrin. And we think of David as a warrior, maybe as a poet, of course, as a king. But David was also the greatest, or one of the greatest Torah scholars of his day. We've spoken about in the past how David found out that he's going to expire, he's going to die on a Shabbos. So he would study from the beginning of Shabbos to the end of Shabbos, nonstop. David was the consummate leader who was the greatest political leader of his day and the greatest Torah sage of his time. The Talmud tells us that any halachic position that David took, it was universally accepted. He was such a great Torah star, towering over all of his contemporaries that the law followed him in every instance. And here's another part of this lesson. A king is not allowed to forego his honor. Suppose you're a king. And you say, ah, you know what? There's no need to stand up and I walk in the room. There's no need to be so deferential to me. You want to be more humble. You are not allowed to be more humble. Because you represent the crown. You are the heart of the Jewish people. And therefore, it's not within your power to forego, to yield on your honor. That's the halacha. Melech shemachal al kvodo akin who says, I forgive, I forego, I don't want any honor. Ein kvodo machal. It doesn't work. So this is telling us, again, we're looking at these two people here. David's the greatest Torah scholar. Achitofel is a terrible villain. Someone who not only mutinied against David, but someone who's forever locked out of Olam Abba. And a king is not allowed to forego his honor. Nevertheless, the king is deferential to Achitofel because he taught him Torah. And this tells us that this is not something which is 
a nice thing to do. You know what? It's a nice thing. If someone teaches you Torah, you should give them honor. It's a nice thing. If it was a nice thing, David would not be allowed to forego his honor. This is showing us that it's mandatory. The only way that David is allowed to be deferential to Achitofel, it's only because of this law. The law that states someone teaches you Torah, regardless of how little it is, you must accord them honor. Now, which two laws did Achitofel teach David? The Mishnah does not tell us. Achitofel, this really interesting, troubling, tragic figure, taught David two laws. Which laws the Mishnah is moot about? But of course, as he always does, Rashi bails us out. Rashi tells us the two laws. Really interesting. The first law, Achitofel found David studying Torah. And he was studying Torah by himself without a study partner. And Achitofel walked over to David and said to him, why are you studying Torah by yourself? Don't you know, and quotes a verse in scripture, I believe it's in Jeremiah, that there is a sword against those who people study Torah by themselves. You have to always study with a, with a study partner. Because if you go awry, you're by yourself, you don't have a sounding board, you don't have someone to resist your position, someone to fight back, so to speak, if you're saying something wrong, there's a risk of you going off track, working by yourself, there is a risk of corrupting Torah. There has to be checks and balances. First law that Achitovel taught David. The second law that Achitovel taught David is that he once saw David walking into the academy, to the study hall, standing up tall and erect. And he said to him, wait a minute, the verse says that you have to be fearful of the temple, the tabernacle, the sanctuary of God. And every place where Torah study is being held is considered like a sanctuary of God. And therefore you have to have dread and trepidation when you walk in. And you can't walk in all proud, standing tall and erect. Those are the two laws that Achitofel taught David. And notwithstanding the fact that David was the greatest scholar, and he was much greater than Achitofel. And notwithstanding the fact that David was a king, and notwithstanding the fact that, that Achitofel was a real villain, and someone who is on the blacklist for eternity, quite literally, nevertheless, David, in the book of Psalms, calls him his superior. And the mission concludes by saying, there's no honor outside of Torah. There's no goodness outside of Torah. Honor. Why would people be recipients of honor? So the commentaries note, well, if someone's really rich, you give them honor. If someone's really handsome and beautiful, you give them honor. But any honor that is contingent on something else, well, the person themselves is not the recipient of the honor. It's the other thing. And therefore, they don't really have honor because it's not them that's being honored. It's all those ancillary things that make them, so to speak, worthy, deserving of honor. Whereas when someone gets honored for their Torah study, the Torah study, well, that's who they are. That becomes who they are. They earn the Torah study. It becomes their Torah. It's the act of acquisition, so to speak. The Almighty's Torah becomes your Torah. We pray, give us our portion of your Torah. When a person studies Torah, they acquire it. It's theirs. And therefore, it makes them worthy of honor. And therefore, if Torah is so precious, we must accord honor to those who convey it to us, to those who teach it to us. I want to go through some of the commentators here that say very advanced ideas. And I'm going to give a disclaimer that some of these ideas are a little bit Kabbalistic. I can read Hebrew so we can read them, but I'm fully acknowledging that some of these ideas are very, very lofty and are above my head. But I figured given it's, it's a, it's a short 
short idea really in this Mishnah. Let's try to see what the commentators say and how they expand the lessons of this Mishnah. So first, let's look at the Chassid Yaivetz, one of our favorite commentators on Perti Avos. So he says two points here. First thing he says, Torah makes the man. When you have Torah, you're a changed person. Therefore, if someone gives you Torah, they're like a partner in your formation. They're like a parent. The Talmud tells us there's three partners in every person. Father offers some biological contributions. Mother, she does that as well. And of course, God. Who are the three parents, so to speak, of every human? Father, mother, the biological forebearers of the person. And of course, God that makes it all work, puts in the software, makes everything functional and operational. Those are three partners. Well, if Torah, if that fundamentally changes a person on a physiological level, they are forever changed and they are uplifted as we've seen in this chapter. Well, then there's another parent. And that's the one who teaches them Torah. In scripture, we read how the verse says, these are the children of Moshe and Aaron. And then it proceeds to list the children of Aaron and Aaron alone. And the children of Moshe are omitted. And the Talmud asks the question, wait a minute, don't tell me the children. These are the children of Moshe and Aaron. And then it lists only the children of Aaron. Says the Talmud. They were also Moshe's children because Moshe taught them Torah. And if you teach Torah to someone else, you are like their parent. You're like their parent because you are a spiritual parent of them. Your biological parents bring you to this world. Your spiritual parents, they give you Torah and that's the key for you to enter the next world. And therefore, they are effectively, your parent. And therefore, just like we have to honor honor our parents, it's one of the Ten Commandments, you got to honor your parents. This Mishnah is telling you that you have spiritual parents as well. Your spiritual parents are the ones who teach you Torah, and therefore, you have to honor them. Well, what do you do if your dad's just a terrible guy? Mom's a terrible person. Are you absolved? from the commandment in the Torah, in the Ten Commandments, to honor them? Is there a carve-out? Honor thy father and mother, except in the event that they are... Does it say that? I don't think it does. It doesn't. Honor thy parents, irrespective of their righteousness, their goodness, their character. After all, they brought you to this world. You have to give them honor. If we have spiritual parents as well, even if they're total degenerates like Achitofel, we have to accord them honor. Tremendous idea. Someone teaches you Torah. Totally different than every other domain and discipline. This is like the equivalent of your spiritual parent. And then the Chassid Yaivet says something, which this is where it gets a little bit Kabbalistic. He says... That when someone conveys Torah to someone else, there is a flow of holiness from the soul of the person who is conveying the Torah to the soul of the person who is receiving that Torah. And to the degree of the holiness of the soul of the person who is speaking, that is the degree of effectiveness of the recipient understanding and, and accepting those words. And that's why it explains the Yavitz when the Jewish people were at Sinai and had a choice. And Rashi, of course, in chapter 19 of Exodus, goes through the whole dialogue between Moshe and the Jewish people and God. The Jewish people were given a choice. You want to hear Torah. Okay, we're here to get the Torah. Who do you want to tell you the Torah? Do you want it to come from Moshe? Or do you want it to come from God himself? And they said, we want to hear from God. Now, ultimately, after the first two of the Ten Commandments, they said, ah, it's too much for us to handle. Moshe, we're going to downgrade it. Now we'll hear from Moshe. So the first two, they heard from God, and the subsequent eight, they heard from Moshe. 
which the Talmud tells us in the book of Marcos on page 24a at the very top. And by the way, if you read the actual words of the Ten Commandments, it's quite clear that God's talking directly to the Jewish people in the first two commandments, and it's done via Moshe. Moshe's voice was amplified by God in the subsequent eight. Why did the Jewish people want to hear from God? Because of this idea that the conveyance of Torah, it's more than just ideas, it's the holiness of the soul coming along with the conveyance of the Torah, and therefore the one from God, because they're going to get, so to speak, holiness from God. Moshe, as great as he is, he ain't God. And therefore, his, of course, his soul is very lofty, very holy, but to get it from the source is even holier. And that's why they wanted to hear from God. And this is the idea of our Mishnah. Achitofel is a low life and a degenerate and someone who is permabanned from Olam Abba. Someone like this, the holiness of his soul is very minuscule. Moreover, David, king of Israel, the heart of the whole nation, maybe one of the holiest souls of all time, how much holiness is flowing from Achitofel to David? Very, 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 very little. And nevertheless, he is according him honor. Thus, all the more so, it is critical for us to record honor to those who teach us Torah. That's the first idea. Again, it's a very advanced idea. What does this mean? that there is a flow of holiness from the soul of the giver of the Torah to the recipient of the Torah. I don't really know what that means. It sounds very, very Kabbalistic, but that's what the Chassid Yavit says. I'm just reading it. Don't it expect me to explain what that actually means. I don't know. I fully acknowledge that. But I thought it's a very very compelling idea, very intriguing idea. And now we're going to do the next one. And if you thought that this idea from the Chassid Yavit was difficult and Kabbalistic, wait till you hear what we have next. The next piece comes courtesy of the Ruach Chaim, again, one of our favorite commentators on Pirkei Avos, written by the great Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, the primary student of the Gona of Vilna, the founder of the Volozhin Yeshiva, the mother of all yeshivos, the kind of the first modern yeshiva. And he says something which is even more Kabbalistic, but we'll go through it. You know, I read it. I wasn't sure I understood it. I found it very fascinating. Nonetheless, we'll go through it. Maybe you'll understand it more than I did. So he says like this. He starts off with a teaching in the Zohar. So right away, our uh, senses, our red flags, whoa, this is coming from the Kabbalistic sources. What does he say? What does it say here? Kuchabrihu veoraisa veoskeha chadu. The Almighty and his Torah and those who study his Torah are all one. What does this mean? So he explains. Because we know that the Almighty and his will are inseparable. They're one. And the Torah is his will. And the souls, the souls of people who study it, They are cleaving to God. And the souls emanate, the the origin of the souls, they emanate, so to speak, from the breath of God. God blew into Adam's nostrils the soul of life. Okay. And every soul that believes in Torah, and I'm just just doing a translation here of what he's saying, because it's very advanced ideas. Every soul that believes in Torah, the root of that soul is cleaved and grasps onto the tree of life that is the eternal life. And it clasps onto one letter of the Torah. And that letter of Torah that is above all the worlds and it is connected to this person, to this lowly world, like links in a chain, And the head of it is still in its roots on high. And that's the relationship we have with Torah. Again, very advanced ideas. But he does bring it back to our Mishnah. It might take a while, though. And then he explains. 
If, God forbid, a person corrupts a spark of their soul with sin, and that sin makes them liable of kares, of spiritual disenfranchisement, there is a severing of their soul with that root in heaven. There's a cut in the link in the chain. And that's what it means when the verse says that the soul be cut off from its people, meaning that that particular spark of the soul will be cut off from its source, but not necessarily that the entire soul will be cut off from its entire source. So this, of course, is seems like a, like a tangent, tangential idea, but he's setting us up here for an idea that he's going to convey that's related to our Mishnah. The soul is connected to its roots in heaven, and that's the Torah. And therefore, if you sever a part of, of your relationship with Torah, you're severing your, that part of your soul's connection with heaven, and therefore it ceases to exist, it's cut off. But even if a person, this is to me a very big takeaway, just in isolation from this idea, from this comment. Even if a soul gets cut off from its people, it doesn't mean that the entirety of the soul, one spark of the soul, the spark of the soul is related to that particular part of Torah, that is what gets cut off. But the rest of the soul is still rooted and cleaving to the Torah, and thus there is still life for the rest of the soul. Very advanced stuff. Then he starts talking about a klipa. Klipa means like a like a shell or, or a peel. And he says that all the great things are enshrouded in a hard shell, in a hard case, and you have to break through that particular shell to get the fruit, just like the fruit. You want the fruit, but you got to first cut away the shell, the peel. Okay. And I'm just scanning here to try to get to the point that he brings when it's related to our Mishnah. So we have this idea of, this is again a basic Kabbalistic idea, even though it's a little advanced, that all the good things are covered by those bad things. Just like you have the fruit and the peel. You don't want to eat the peel. You want to eat the fruit. But the only way to get to the fruit is via the peel. What that means, again, very advanced idea. I fully acknowledge that. I don't know what exactly what he's talking about. And then he quotes another idea. And this is the idea that's going to connect it to our Mishnah. And again, I want to repeat that I promise. I said I don't really understand what he's saying. He says that sometimes there's a, quotes a, a Zohar, that there's a, there's a cloud that is covering the sun. What does that mean? If you have a candle and you put the candle in a, you surround it, so to speak, so you can't see the candle, well, then the light doesn't penetrate. But if you if you put the, a cloud trying to, trying to cover up the sun, today in Houston, Texas, it's a little cloudy, but you know what? You can still see outside. Why can you still see outside? Well, because we have the sun. The sun is able to penetrate even the clouds, even the things that normally would inhibit the light from penetrating. That's the power of the sun. And then he tells us that a mitzvah is like a candle. A mitzvah cannot penetrate the clouds. But Torah is like the sun, and the sun can penetrate the clouds. Torah is so powerful, it's able to break through all the resistance and to break through all those shells and to break through all those clipot to get through all those inhibitions. But the only way for Torah to be so powerful and so transformative to break through all the resistance, it's only with a person whose soul still has a connection, still has some of those chains linking it to its roots in heaven. When someone still has this strong connection with eternal life, with those roots of Torah and of their soul in heaven, that is when Torah is so powerful to break through all the darkness. But the people who are included in the list, who are on the blacklist, who are permabad from Olam Abba, that doesn't mean someone, you know, did one sin that has charis, gets disenfranchised, one spark of their soul loses its connection. 
That's someone who has absolutely no connection. All those little links are cut off. They are forever banned from eternity because they've lost all their connection to their roots in heaven. And someone like that, their Torah does not have that special power to break through the clouds. And that's how he preaches Tar Mishnah. Achitofel is one of the four people, the four lay people that the Mishnah says they are cut off from all about meaning. They have absolutely no connection with the spiritual world. When we talk about the Torah and God being one and, and the souls of the people who study Torah are part of that, it means because they're connected to that. But the soul of Achitofel, who had absolutely no connection to the spiritual world, all of his links were severed. He does not have a connection to that heavenly Torah that's able to break through all the resistance. And therefore his Torah is much weaker. The signal is much fainter. And that's the lesson. David, he only studied from Achitofel two things. And those things were like these isolated laws. It wasn't Torah with all its power and splendor to break through all the resistance. It wasn't Torah that was connected to its source. It wasn't Torah that brought God with it, so to speak. It was these two words of Torah, so to speak. These isolated, discrete ideas of Torah that are completely severed from their spiritual roots. But nevertheless, he accorded him honor. Certainly, when you learn from your friend, it doesn't matter what it is, but you learn even one letter. That letter, again, assuming your friend is not one of those four people that are completely cut off from eternity, that letter actually has its roots in heaven. And the one letter of your friend is much stronger than the two laws of Achitofel because it's connecting you with its roots and with its source in the heavens on high. Certainly, you must accord them honor. Now again, let me repeat what I said already twice. This is very advanced ideas, very Kabbalistic ideas. Of course, these are ideas that appear elsewhere. These are not novel ideas to hear. The idea of uh, our soul and the Torah having its roots in heaven that's an idea that maybe we've even, even spoken about in the past. But amazing, amazing ideas. And this does sound very similar to what the Chassid Yavit says. When you convey Torah, that has a lot of power behind it. Because you are giving someone something which its roots are really in heaven. And if you give someone a little bit of heaven, it could be one one drop, one one dot, one letter. Something really so insignificant but you're giving them something that is heavenly and there's nothing insignificant or negligible or not substantive when it talks about heaven. And therefore, how much must, must we value and cherish every little bit of Torah? What an amazing idea. I think maybe one of the takeaway ideas that we can just pour it over to our base of knowledge is the idea that kares, someone gets cut off from the Jewish people, that is not the equivalent of someone who loses all of that forever. It means they lose a little spark, a little connection, but they're still, they still may have life in eternity. I, th- I think that's a very important, valuable takeaway, uh, that helps us understand the destiny of, of the soul. You know, there are a lot of sinners out there that aren't included in this list of for people that are locked out of Olam Abba. But now we understand that idea, but the general principle of this Mishnah is the continuation of the theme of this whole chapter, and that is lauding and valuing Torah. Torah is so transformative. Torah is so uplifting. Even one law, even one verse, even one word, even one letter forever changes your life. And someone who gives that to you is like your spiritual parent. And you must accord them honor. Even if they're not the greatest person out there, it doesn't matter. You must appreciate, if you really appreciate Torah, again, that's, that's, the, that's the lesson of this whole chapter. To really appreciate what Torah is all about, if you really had that appreciation, you would know that there's no amount of Torah that is rendered insignificant. Every little bit of Torah coming from every source must be valued, cherished, and appreciated, and you must accord that person respect and honor for giving you a little piece of eternity. 
As always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to your questions and your comments.